Cybersecurity Awareness Training. Welcome to our first lesson on phishing. What is phishing, you may ask? Guys, look at this. Look at this. Well, what if I said it was kind of like fishing for fish, but not really? I'll bet you're confused already. Keep this comparison in mind while we move forward with the course. Phishing is defined as the use of a fraudulent email or sometimes text to get a person to do something. In the case of the banking email shown here, a cyber criminal sends you what appears to be a valid email from your banking institution asking you to verify your banking details, but in fact provides them with access to your financial records. Unfortunately for most organizations, the human employee is the weakest link in their security infrastructure. The cyber criminals know this and fish for someone that is gullible enough to click a link or open an attachment and grant them free access. The cyber criminals bank on the idea that at least one person isn't cyber aware and the scare tactics used in phishing would force them to follow the fake instructions, which makes their job easier. Why fight security tools when you can when you can circumvent them through the use of a phishing email? A phishing email will look authentic more often than not. It will look like the example shown asking you to confirm your password, when in reality this email is from a cyber criminal looking to gain access to your account and possibility other information. As a quick tip, Microsoft will not contact you about your password, and if you didn't request a password change, then you are safer deleting this email. There are several reasons that cyber criminals do what they do, and money isn't always the motivation. Today, cybercrime can be motivated by political agendas, by other countries, or as malicious as just for fun. Phishing emails will look very authentic. They will come from businesses you use every day and even use scare tactics to frighten you into doing what they need for you to do. You should verify directly with the source and never provide any information unless you go directly to that site. Most importantly, never call a number or click on a link from one of these mails, especially if you're not sure. So now that we have an idea about what phishing is, let's look at preventative measures. Phishing can be prevented by looking extra carefully at an email that looks suspicious, especially if it strangely is asking for personal information. Never open or download attachments. Companies like Netflix, Amazon, or even your credit cards will ever email you sensitive documents don't trust it. If you suspect that an email is a phishing email, you should verify it with the source directly to make sure that it is authentic. Or simply ask your IT department or IT professional, if you have one, to check the email for you. In some cases and in some organizations, you'll have a button like the one shown here that allows you to automatically send a potential phishing email straight to your IT professionals to verify that the email is safe for you to read. So now let's try and identify some basic phishing indicators. Contrary to what you might think, it is possible to identify phishing emails, especially if you have a Keaton eye. For instance, this Amazon email is not from an Amazon This page from Netflix is asking you for your social security. Netflix will never ask you for your social security. And of course Facebook. If you look at the address, even though it looks like a Facebook page, the web address says keton.org, not facebook.com. So you should always be careful before entering valid 
credentials to a site, to an email, or even banking information to a company you do business with, unless you know 100% that it is a valid any of the previous emails and websites could easily jeopardize your personal information. Guys, look at this. Look at this. So if you remember, I asked you to keep this phishing comparison in mind as we progress through this lesson. Cyber criminals will bait people with phishing emails in the hope of landing your personal information. So be careful. And if you're not sure, always ask or verify. Cybersecurity Awareness Training. Welcome to Lesson 2, where we will explore the different types of phishing. And yes, there are different types. In Lesson 1, we talked about what phishing was and what can happen. In Lesson 1, we discussed the most common type of phishing, email phishing. While some phishing mails, like the one shown here, are very obvious, the scare tactic is often enough to get the unsuspecting to click and get hooked. As we progress, we are going to see that phishing attempts get more targeted and less obvious. While traditional phishing aims for quality over quantity, spear phishing is directed at a specific person and often by name. Cyber criminals do their homework and study a person's social media profile and company websites. They learn who people are and request tasks specifically related to their job function. Here you see a person, likely another employee, at the same organization asking for sensitive employee information to be emailed as a precaution, the employee should verify the request. Phishing tactics get even more targeted with whale phishing, where cyber criminals use the top tier players in an organization to strong arm subordinates into completing a task. Out of the fear of not wanting to deny a top level manager, many whaling attempts are successful. In my history, I've seen many of these attempts, and if the employee doesn't think to ask, the organization will likely fall victim. Especially when the employee only had to look and notice that the email address was written incorrectly or not part of the organization's email. Domain phishing is successful because the emails look really authentic. Cyber criminals use logos and wording common to the organization they are pretending to be. Even if you do click on the link, you are likely to end up at a fake yet authentic looking website. In the example, you see an actual phishing email from PayPal that was usually enough to get a person to click. One, you should ask yourself, do I even have a PayPal account? And always, absolutely always, go directly to PayPal.com to verify the claim, saving yourself a lot of trouble. Here is where the tools get interesting. Now the cyber criminals are going to call you and try to obtain personal and or financial information. If you've ever had a suspicious robocall, You've probably experienced a phishing attempt, voice phishing, especially when phone numbers are searchable on the internet. One of the most common is the IRS phishing attempts that start around tax season, telling you that you need to call the IRS at a number provided and provide a credit card number to pay back taxes. Another is the tech support call that is telling you that you have a virus. Listen to the example. Hello. 
Oh, hello. Can I speak to Mr. Jones, please? Speaking. Hello, Mr. Jones. My name is Kevin. I work for the Microsoft Cyber Security Task Force, based in Lambeth Road, London. The reason I'm calling is that your computer has been identified as having been infected with the new version of the Zeus virus, and your personal and financial data is at risk. Here at Microsoft, we're committed to ensuring that our customers are safe from hackers. We've therefore contacted you to advise you of the situation and to help you to remove the virus from your computer. I will talk you through the first steps you need to take so that we can remove the virus for you and make sure your data is safe. All you need to do is ensure you're in front of your computer and able to follow my instructions. Would you give that person access to your computer? I hope not. This is a common scam being used in... It's important to note, no one will ever call you because you have a virus on your computer. You should always be wary of the phone calls that ask for personal information or ask to give, to be granted access to... The next type of phishing involves your cell phone. Sure, you can be vished on a cell phone as easily as on a landline, that is if you still have one, but the smishing technique, SMS phishing, uses a text to send you a link or opt-in message where a cyber criminal can infect your phone. Yes, I said, infect your phone. That infection can then retrieve information such as contacts and passwords directly from your phone. Alternatively, a text will warn you of a locked account or possibly a bank transaction which will usually make people click the link and again you will receive that authentic page asking for personal information or financial data. I would suggest that you treat unsolicited texts the same way you treat unsolicited phone calls and just hang up. Often in our urgency to look for something on the internet, we end up hit with what is known as search engine phishing. Cyber criminals pay to move their fake websites up to the top of your Google search. And yes, that is legal and a thing. Looking at the example, you see that the top three results for downloading Google's Chrome browser are not directly from Google's website, which should automatically be a flag. But often in our haste, we can download tainted software or end up at a fake website asking for personal data. Stemming from search engine phishing and that ill-fated click that lands you on a spoofed website Yes, spoofed is another way to say fake. A website that looks so authentic that unless you take a good look, you don't notice the differences. Things such as putting two N's at the end of Amazon, or using an R and an N to look like the M in Amazon. These are very subtle and difficult to spot. And yet another reason, you should always type the address as opposed to clicking a link. Image and attachment phishing still exists, but with new security tools are often caught. The idea for these was that an attachment or embedded picture contained some type of malware or spyware that activates when clicked. A common version of this is the bank statement being emailed to you by a random bank, or a picture or file being sent by someone you might know that has the same effect. That spyware can then be used to collect information without your knowledge. As a user of the internet, you need to understand that phishing comes in many forms. Be cyber aware enough to know that you should never click on an email, SMS, text, or web page 
unless you are 100% sure of its validity. Never give up personal information, and don't be intimidated by the false threats of a phishing email. And always follow the common ideology of it's too good to be true, then it probably is. Sadly, one of these days you may accidentally click on an email or text and end up with compromised information. So right away you should contact your bank, your creditors, or even the credit bureaus if you think you got tricked. Change account passwords as soon as possible. And always be aware of cold calls from callers claiming to be with some business or some organization that you may or may not have heard of. It's important to be cyber aware. Cybersecurity Awareness Training. Welcome to Lesson 3, where we will explore examples of phishing attacks and how to spot them. Email spoofing, or name impersonation, is the method used in traditional phishing. How to best fool an unsuspecting recipient than by making the email appear as if it comes from someone they know, or a company they do business with. Because why would the HR department lead you astray? Most would click on the link and possibly follow through with the request. That simple click just compromised your computer, network, or both. You should also stop and look and notice that this email from HR is coming from a Gmail account. Mass mailings are nothing new. Just look at the stack of junk mail sitting on your coffee table. Now imagine these as email, with multiple emails from credit card companies and other department stores. These emails have brands and logos, some even promise payments, gift cards, or even look like authentic transactions or statements. These emails will be like the example that comes from Citibank, where you are asked for your card number and PIN, where these cyber criminals are waiting to collect and exploit. Just like mass mailing, cyber criminals are banking on just a few people not being cyber aware and getting that payoff. My best recommendation is to shred these emails, delete them, unless you're sure they're real. And if you're not, call the company directly. It's just safer. People are social enough to click on a random URL link, including a friend request and message that appears to come from their social media of choice. A link that will ask them to log in and share their information. Unfortunately, with cyber criminals. You might even receive a phishing email that appears to come from your bank with a URL link that usually claims to take you to their website or provide a copy of a transaction that is being questioned. That link or URL might even take you to a spoof website. Remember these? That looks real, but eventually takes you to a site that allows them to collect your information. Spoof websites go hand in hand with misspelled URLs. A domain that kind of looks like where you want to go, and a website that kind of looks like where you want to go, but in fact is not real. The URL or web address that has an almost unnoticeable misspelling, like the Amazon.com addresses that we talked about last lesson. Cyber criminals bank on people not noticing the difference in time to save their personal information. Always keep a close eye, especially if you clicked on a questionable link. Better to back out. Just take, for instance, the Citibank email that has two eyes. I bet you didn't see them. Homographic attacks usually come in internet pop-ups, which look like offers from brand name businesses that usually make promises that are probably too good to be true. They always contain a link to a spoofed website 
with a misspelled URL in the, ad, in the domain address, which is owned by cyber criminals, where you almost always need to provide info or pay a fee to collect. Hopefully by now you've noticed that phishing techniques are used in combinations to make them trickier and more likely to fool you. If an offer is too good to be true, or you have to pay something to get something, it's likely a scam. Just take a look at this sample from Amazon. You're being offered a gift card, which looks great, but when you look at the URL, you see that instead of having the traditional A-M-A-Z-O-N, you have an A-R-N-A-Z-O-N, which almost looks like an M and makes it easier to fool your eyes. Subdomain attacks are designed to dupe the less technically inclined, those less likely to know the difference between www.google.fake.com and www.google.com. The former being part of a site called fake.com. But since the word Google is in there, most people don't read past that. And again, we find different types of phishing at play. Let's face it, most of us use the website and never, and I mean never, look for the URL, which is why subdomain misspelled URLs and spoofed websites work. The only way to defend is to keep a watchful eye. For as long as there's been an internet, there have been pop-ups. So much that pop-up blockers have been built into your internet browser, which often cause problems for good problems, and yes, those exist. In-session phishing, or phishing with pop-ups, will happen when you're on a valid site, and even look like they belong to that site. The example you see here popped up with your banking site, asking you for your credit information. Know that at no point will you ever ever be asked for your full account numbers, much less your PIN number, at a credit or banking site. They already have that information. Never type accounts and PIN numbers onto any site. The absolute worst is where all these techniques are combined to make you believe that you're on your banking site. The examples shown here all look authentic, but all are actually fake. And the moment you enter your credentials, the cyber criminals have your account. Worse yet, scammers launch thousands of these attacks every day, hour, or minute. And still, more often than not, they're successful. We listened to a sample vishing call in the last lesson and saw how someone was trying to compromise our personal computer. However, vishing attacks can be much more devious and make our accounts getting compromised look easy. The same way a visher can call you and attempt to compromise you, through basic social media research, they can impersonate you and obtain even more sensitive data. Look at how this would-be Fisher compromises an account in two minutes. And an internet connection. You want to do a sample vishing call? What's vishing? Vishing is voice solicitation, and basically um, what you do is you use the phone to extract information or data points that can be used in a later attack. Let's do it. Will okay. you, who are you going to call? Maybe I'll call your cell phone provider okay. and see if I can get them to give me your email address. I, I bet they're good. I bet they have my back. <laughs> but yeah, go go for it. I'm going to spoof from your number, so it's going to look like it's calling from you. Okay. Hi. I'm actually, I'm so sorry. Can you hear me okay? I, my baby, I'm sorry. <laughs> my, <laughs> my husband's like, we're about to apply for a loan, and we just had a baby, and he's like, get this done by today, so I'm so sorry. I can't I, um, call you back. <laughs> I'm trying to log into our account for uses information, and I can't remember what email address we use to log the account. The baby's crying, and um, can, can you help me? 
Awesome. In just 30 seconds, at gmail.com, Jessica gets access to my personal email address. Now, if I needed to um, add our older daughter on our account so she could call in and make changes, how would I need to go about doing that? You would have to send me a secure pin through a text message? Yeah. Well, the thing is, I don't think I'll be able to receive a text message if I'm on the phone. Oh, I'm not on there either? I, so I thought when we got married, um, he added me to the account. Jess uses my girlfriend's name and a fake social security number 5127 to set up her own personal access to my account. Wait, I'm sorry, so there's no password on my account right now? Can I set that up? She even gets the support person to change my password. Thank you so much for your help today. So she just basically blocked me out of my own account. I'll get her fed after this. <laughs> be wary of calls claiming to be from creditors or businesses. Tell them you'll call them back, especially the more that they insist. As we wrap up lesson three, the discussion of phishing techniques, attacks, and combinations, and how to identify them, know that there are many more beyond what we discussed here. Most of the work falls on you as an internet user to be on the lookout, to be cyber aware, and invest in a good security software, antivirus, anti-spyware, Always think before you click. And if you feel you've been fished, visit identitytheft.gov for guidance. And immediately call your bank and creditors just in case. Now that you've gotten a few lessons into the course, I present you with some practice tests similar to the ones your employer would provide you. The company Know Before is well known for being a provider of corporate and organizational cybersecurity training. They offer free testing to measure your current cyber awareness in topics like phishing. You will be required to register for the test. It is free of charge. The following two practice tests are on phishing and social media phishing. I encourage you to register and see where your cyber awareness stands today. Now that you've gotten a few lessons into the course, I present you with some practice tests similar to the ones your employer would provide you. The company Know Before is well known for being a provider of corporate and organizational cybersecurity training. They offer free testing to measure your current cyber awareness in topics like phishing. You will be required to register for the test. It is free of charge. The following two practice tests are on phishing and social media phishing. I encourage you to register and see where your cyber awareness stands today. Cybersecurity Awareness Training Welcome to our next lesson on cyber awareness, where we will discuss the overarching topic of social engineering. Phishing from Lesson 1 is actually a type of social engineering. So why cover phishing first, you may ask? Phishing is a comprehensive social engineering technique used to gain information using technology as its vehicle, making it more common to a random computer user. Social engineering's primary goal is to obtain information for the purposes of extorting an individual or an organization or simply to further an agenda. The power behind social engineering is its ability to evolve and adapt its methods with changes in technology and always being able to fall back on low-tech solutions discussed in this lesson. Social engineering attacks can be very elaborate and involve multiple people or organizations. The more research conducted by these cyber criminals, the more effective the attack can be. They can use third party companies or even your customers that you do business with. And it all starts with an email or a phone call. Because social engineering requests for information via email, text, or even by phone, tools like firewalls and antiviruses are easily subverted completely undetectable by technology means. Detection requires the tools you were born with. 
and some basic cyber awareness training. For social engineering, it's all in the name, social. And it's all about gaining the confidence of an unsuspecting individual or organization. Once a cyber criminal has gained the trust of someone inside the organization, they tend to turn our own human nature against us. They use a three-phased approach to select a target, research it, and implement their attack. As stated with phishing, it isn't always about financial gains. The first phase in a social engineering attack involves selecting a target and researching publicly available personal information. That statement should be somewhat confusing and frightening for most, especially those with social media profiles that are not properly secured or other public sites that host bits and pieces of your personal information. One piece of information leads to another, which leads to another, which eventually leads to enough information to where they can initiate contact. Once these cyber criminals know enough about you or your organization, they can attempt to contact and begin the process of obtaining information for their real objective. For instance, they learn from your social media profile that you have been recently promoted at your company. They know where you work, who your boss is, and they turn around and send you a phishing email pretending to be your boss and ask you for information, or maybe even a bank transfer. You not knowing and being new to the role, comply. At this point, your company has been compromised and you've likely been the third and final phase begins with the cyber criminals attack. They have the information they need to implement their attack. Whether this is a phishing email that gets sent out to various members of the organization, or they simply plan on infiltrating the organization by impersonating a third party person, someone that no one would think to notice. More on that later. Their attack can leave malware and viruses behind, allowing them to further their agenda at a later time. These can include tools like ransomware, which we will also discuss later. There are several methods employed by cyber criminals in order to social engineer a target. One of the most common is authority. They impersonate someone in charge or in control most people fall for this because they don't want to defy their boss or a supervisor. On the heels of authority is intimidation. They make the receiver fearful that their lack of action will lead to consequences. They enhance the effect by adding a deadline. If this doesn't get done now, then this horrible event will happen and it will be all your fault. Social proof is another attempt at deception by cyber criminals, stating that this person was able to provide the information before, but they're on vacation today, at least according to their social media profile, making the person think, well, if that person did it, then it must be okay, especially when you can verify that the person they name is actually on vacation. And just like that, they have your trust and most importantly, your information. If you've ever watched an SC on TV infomercial, then you've experienced scarcity. Act now, offers are limited. Don't think about it, just do it. Click here. Scareware is a type of malicious yet often fake software that makes you believe that you have a virus on your computer or your computer has simply malfunctioned. Usually you are instructed to buy something or call a number for further instructions. And in that instant, they have your credit card and personal information. Familiarity is often done with in-person social engineering. Hey, don't you remember me? We talked last week at the picnic. Hey, by the way, could you buzz me in? I forgot my badge. 
It seems like a harmless conversation. But you just likely let a criminal in the front door. This method allows them to gain your trust by trying to make themselves familiar to you. With familiarity comes trust. That phone call from IT or another department who try to gain your trust on the phone. Remember, that's called phishing trying to gain access to your computer or information. It is incredible the length people will go to when they trust someone. Because why would John from the IT department not need access to your computer? Baiting, or the old bait and switch, is something seen with phishing. You get an email promising a free gift card or a movie download. When you click on the link, you get <laughs> creamed carrots and malware. Another method for baiting an unsuspecting individual is by dropping USB flash drives or diskettes once upon a time and counting on people's curiosity to get the better of them and have them plug them into their work and home computers easily compromises their information. Social engineering starts with you and how much you share with the world. The more you share, the more ammunition you provide to would-be cyber criminals. Understand that social engineering doesn't require a computer. It can be very low-tech so your antivirus will not save you. You and your cyber awareness are your best and only hope. Cybersecurity Awareness Training In this lesson, we put the focus on who is doing this to you and your organization. We know that the whys can range from revenge to financial incentives. The whos, however, are sometimes surprising. By now you should, at the bare minimum, know that your personal information or that of your customers is valuable. On a part of the internet where these cyber criminals congregate, called the dark web, your personal data is sold like where is it at garage sale by people like my friend Riley here. These criminals can be, for, can be foreign or domestic, male or female, young or old. These attacks can be conducted by a single individual or groups of people. Most recently, we are finding that actual governments are sponsoring these attacks in what is now being called cyber warfare. Sometimes these attacks are like a cheap B-rated movie. The attack is coming from inside the building. Would-be criminals follow a person through a secured door because once you're on the inside, you're more trusted and just another face in the crowd. Alternatively, you can use social engineering, getting someone to bypass security protocols for you. This is done simply as the graphic shows. Hey, Joe, how about them cowboys? Hey, by the way, I can't grab my badge. Could you help me out, Joe? Just by throwing in the person's name and talking about the sports that you saw them following on their social media, it was that simple to socially engineer the security guard and have him let you in the door. Another method is through impersonation tactics. While this seems far-fetched or even from a movie, pretending that you belong there sometimes works. A hacker named Kevin Metnick wrote a book called The Art of Intrusion, where he details dressing up and impersonating a UPS man or even a janitor simply because no one really looks at these people. For all intents and purposes, these people are invisible to most. When, it come, when is the last time 
you acknowledged your mail person, your custodian, or even the delivery guy. In the phishing lesson, we talked about fake phone calls called vishing. These calls often come from call centers full of sponsored criminals or just someone that wants to, that means you harm. It's important again to remember to never give personal information over the phone and be wary of cold calls that are on the pushy side and if intimidation is used just hang up. Remember the IT department, Microsoft, or even Dell computers is not going to call you because your computer has a problem. As mentioned before, cyber criminals bank on people's curiosity and ignorance when it comes to technology. Littering a parking lot or public place with USB drives that people will pick up and plug into their computers at home or at work are an easy in. With that, their attack begins usually because that flash drive contains malware and often grants the attacker access to your information and you thought you had scored a free flash drive with confidential information. We've heavily discussed phishing emails last lesson but know that you're not the only one targeted. Most of the time these cyber criminals send out hundreds if not thousands of these same emails hoping that at least a small percentage of the recipients will click the link, call the number, or provide the required information. As stated at the beginning of the lesson, one of the socials in social engineering comes from social media. We know that cyber criminals conduct a lot of research on their intended targets through social media. It is also a person's right to be as public as they like, or even more these days. However, this can and will be used against you. So review your security settings. The more you give them, the more of a target you become. Social engineers don't need technology to further their agendas. They just need to be patient and willing to research and plan carefully until they're ready. Remember that these criminals are not just in your email anymore. They can be the delivery man or that frantic guy at the security gate who forgot their badge yet knows so much about you. Lastly, be careful of phone calls that seemingly intimidate you or just are unexpected. Just hang up. It's safer. Cybersecurity Awareness Training. In this last lesson on social engineering, we are going to talk about how to best defend yourself against social engineering attacks, how to be more alert and responsive to phishing and other social engineering attempts. While security tools can protect your personal computer or even your organization from a cyber-based attack, a social engineering attack doesn't need technology to cause damage. The purpose of this course is to educate you and make you more cyber aware and prepare you to defend yourself against social engineering. Before this course, you might not have ever considered verifying a request for information before providing personal information via text, phone, or email. If your employer offers a cyber awareness course, take it and gain some additional insight into what it means to be cyber aware. Cyber criminals and social engineers prey on your emotional intelligence. They learn from your social media presence what you care about and what you don't. They use emotional support to gain your trust. Besides securing your social media, be wary of random strangers offering a shoulder to cry on. Social engineering techniques require additional attention on your part. Be more careful of your actions in public at work and especially on the internet. We live in an age where we overshare on social media and while this is okay, you should at the very minimum review your security settings and what the public can see. The more that is publicly available, the more would-be cyber criminals can use against you. 
But as mentioned, social engineering doesn't require technology to be effective. Be watchful of people that seem out of place. Especially that delivery guy that stays a little too long or asks a lot of questions that may have nothing to do with their purpose there. In general, you should be cautious of who you share your information with, regardless of the method of communication. I'm not saying you should be paranoid of everyone, just be careful of your surroundings. The Think Before You Click campaign has been around for a long time. The message is clear, yet internet users still fall for phishing emails and sites. While the impact of a bad click is not always immediate, viruses can infect your machine or device and slowly steal your information. After reviewing the techniques used in phishing, including fake websites, pop-ups, and phishing emails, you should be extra vigilant and mindful of the internet. This is the only way to defend against social engineering, malware, and phishing. One thing that no one thinks about is the powerful computer you carry in your pocket. Yes, your mobile device or your cell phone. These devices carry more information on them than what you probably have in your entire home. Think about it. Online banking apps, credit cards, social media accounts, not to mention all your pictures. Use multiple methods to lock your phone, and at the same time, the same way you install security software on your desktop or laptop, you should install one on your device also. Most security companies have offerings for your devices also. Remember that the same way bad software can infect your computer, bad apps can compromise your phone. Continuing our discussion on security software, make sure that you not only have it, but that it gets updated regularly. Remember that writing passwords and putting them on post-it notes for everyone to see is the easiest way to get socially engineered. Once social engineers know you don't have security software and that your devices can be exploited, your information is as good as theirs. The cost of security software and tools is negligible compared to the cost of compromised personal data. Although we've said a lot about phishing emails, we really can't say enough. Social engineers know you probably couldn't resist an email from someone you know, especially someone from your social media profile. If that email had a link or an attachment, you also wouldn't think twice of opening it. In that simple act, you installed malware, which can compromise your data and your devices. Again, use what you've learned about phishing techniques to review emails before opening them, especially if they seem out of place. Remember, a simple face-to-face -face conversation with a stranger can actually be with a social engineer that is probably filling in holes in their information about you. Alternatively, they can attempt to gain your trust and then obtain the real information that they're after. Always check with your supervisor before releasing information, even if it appears to be coming from them. Better to be safe than sorry. The best way to defend against social engineering, and we can't say this enough, is to get educated and become more cyber aware. More aware of your use of social medias, email, and other internet-based tools. Have proper security tools in place to defend against the malwares that are used in conjunction with phishing and social engineering. Be careful what you share and who you sh share it with, especially around strangers. Cybersecurity Awareness Training In this next series of lessons, we will briefly touch on the malware that is used in association with phishing and social engineering attempts often used to steal or hijack your personal data and possibly your identity. While they range in severity, they are all malicious and should be avoided at all costs. A hostile, intrusive, and intentionally nasty malware seeks to invade, damage, or disable computers, computer systems, networks, tablets, and even your mobile devices. 
often by taking partial control over the device's operation. Malware, or malicious software, is the categorical name for most of the problematic software seen today. Everything from adware to viruses to the worst possible scenario called ransomware. Malware has continued to evolve with the aid of cyber criminals who use it in their various attacks on non-cyber aware users on the internet. Malwares are often hostile. Malwares often seek to damage your computer. Their goal is usually to disrupt the daily operations to varying degrees. They can gather passwords and financial information, or to the extreme hold your information hostage. Malware can allow remote control of your computer and make it work for these cyber criminals in what is known as a botnet. By now you're asking, how do I get malware? Malware often requires a way in. Something on your computer or device that is exploitable. The most common among them being an unpatched operating system, your Windows. Or an unupdated software, such as an internet browser. Malware doesn't happen by itself. It requires you to make a mistake. And they count on you and your lack of cyber awareness to open the door for them. This is where links and phishing emails and spoofed websites and you clicking on them comes into play. So, how can you tell if you have malware on your machine? The most notable cue will be the performance of your computer or your device. Your computer will likely run slower and behave erratically. Systems fans will run faster or speed up due to the added activity caused by the malware activity. Or you'll notice a simple change, an unexpected change, in your internet homepage. If you have an adware, you will likely see a tidal wave of pop-ups and annoying ads. At the extreme, your system will have repeated crashes and display BSODs or blue screens of death. While the term malware is a global or broad categorical term, each of the types underneath it have varying effects on your devices. Most infections can be prevented using some type of security software, which is maintained and kept up to date. Malware and the subsequent category viruses work much in the same way as viruses in the human body. They interfere with normal operations. But for all their damaging capabilities, they require you and a lack of cyber awareness to really be able to cause any damage. Cybersecurity Awareness Training Adware and Spyware Adware, a type of spyware, tracks your browser history and downloads with the intent of predicting what products or services you're interested in buying. The adware will display advertisements for the same or related products or services to entice you to click and make a purchase. Adware is used for marketing purposes and can slow down your computer. Adware is often installed accidentally or unknowingly by you. This happens when you install things like toolbars and freeware. If you start getting an excessive amount of pop-ups and one happens to offer a way to eliminate those pop-ups it's likely additional malware, so don't use it. Spyware is unwanted software that infiltrates your computing device, stealing your internet usage data and sensitive information. Spyware is used for many purposes. Usually, its aim is to track and sell your internet usage data, capture your credit card or bank account information, or steal your personal identity. Spyware raises the bar by aiding in identity theft. While, like adware, it gathers information on your habits, it relays that information to advertisers, data firms, or questionable external parties. 
Spyware is one of the most common threats on the internet and is difficult to identify and can easily affect your device. So you may be wondering why adware and spyware are useful. And that's because they are used for revenue generation, making money. As a consumer, your interests are valuable to companies looking to capitalize on your interests. They do this by making your computer or browser a personal billboard influencing your purchasing habits. However, remember that some of these pop-ups can also lead to phishing attempts. Remember that spyware can capture everything you type on your keyboard, including passwords and banking details. Removing spyware and adware takes a good anti-malware and a lot of cyber awareness. You should be cautious when installing random programs and freeware, especially when nothing is truly free. When it comes to any form of malware, having a backup of your data and files is beneficial, as you never know when you may encounter a more lethal form of malware. Having security software is of no use if you do not make the effort to run regular scans. Else it's like having a hammer, but no nails. Both malware and spyware are purposeful. They have a task, and that is to steal information off your machine. Adware is usually an annoyance more than anything else. We've all experienced adware. If you've ever browsed Amazon, or some other website and all of a sudden you see ads for that particular item everywhere you look you're experiencing adware. While these are not the worst malware types it is still good to take preventative measures and ensure your internet safety. Cybersecurity Awareness Training Viruses and Worms Viruses and worms are terms more people know when it comes to computer compromises, as they've been around for a very long time. Computer viruses, as stated before, work exactly like they do in the human body. They replicate and prevent you from operating normally. The same way a virus attaches to our cells and compromises us, a computer virus attaches itself to known good programs and begins to cause your computer to malfunction. Worms, on the other hand, like their namesake, burrow through networks, replicating and spreading across these networks and the computers on them. They usually cause damage to the computers and files on those computers, often destroying them in the process. In 2017, the WannaCry worm affected several organizations and caused millions, if not billions of dollars in damages through the use of crypto ransomware. More on that later. So how do I get a virus or a worm on my computer? An unpatched computer operating system, your Windows, is much like a weakened immune system. Infections are easier, thus opening an attachment in a phishing email can lead to an infection with a virus. Or even getting a text with a link can lead to your phone getting a virus. Browsing the internet unprotected can have serious consequences. Having a virus on your machine is usually noticeable to some degree. As mentioned with other malwares, the performance of your computer or your device will be impacted. With worms and viruses and their self-replicating abilities, you may see that your hard disk space starts to get used up, random files will appear or sometimes disappear. The device as a whole will likely be unstable until the offending malware is removed with proper security software. So how do you protect yourself? Well, being cyber aware helps. Knowing what is and isn't safe to do on the internet is important. That followed by good cyber hygiene, as discussed before, also, having a proper antivirus and making sure that your operating system is updated. FYI, Windows 10 takes that chore away from you 
by automatically handling updates as needed. You will notice the behavior of your device being different. And if it behaves strangely, run and install updates for your security software as soon as possible and run a scan. Most security tools will notify you of strange or abnormal behavior. Although we've talked and talked about phishing and attachments, know that this is one of the easiest ways to introduce viruses onto your computer or network. Viruses will attack and corrupt data on an infected machine. Since worms and viruses are designed to replicate and spread, it is very important to have security tools in place to prevent it from spreading and making the problem worse. Cybersecurity Awareness Training Ransomware With the malware known as ransomware, also known as crypto malware, we come to the worst of the worst, a form of malware that extorts millions of dollars every year forcing organizations to close due to lost data and possible data breaches, which probably shared your personal data and that of other customers as part of the ransomware data breach. To put it simple, it's nasty stuff. To put it simply, cyber criminals want either your money or your data. But if they can get both, then they hit a jackpot. There are occasions where this notification of ransomware is a fake. It will just be an internet browser pop-up called Scareware, which is there to frighten you enough into calling the number on the screen and giving them your credit card. Before that, check and see if you can close it or open other files on your computer. If the files on your computer are not affected, then it's likely a fake. Close it and restart your computer. If the ransomware is real and files are inaccessible, you have a decision to make about paying this ransom. The amount might be a deciding factor as an individual or as an organization. Know, however, that you are dealing with a criminal and there is no guarantee you paying will get you back your files. You should notify the police or the other authorities, and you should avoid paying the ransom, if you can avoid it. Whether you believe it or not, your data has value, and your organization's data is even more valuable. Your pictures and documents have sentimental value, and you may have personal identifiable documents among your data that is the real prize for these cyber criminals. When talking organizations, this is multiplied times the number of employees and the personal data of all of those employees working for that company, plus all their customers. All in all, ransomware has cost victims millions in dollars. Ransomware affects your files, your company's files, and even your banking information. These criminals, for all intents and purposes, are cyber terrorists. Most ransomwares start with a phishing attempt via an email or a fake web page. As mentioned in the phishing lesson, cyber criminals are banking on your lack of cyber awareness and you falling for a phishing attempt. Ransomware works like a worm and it spreads just as quickly traversing networks in minutes and seconds, taking entire networks down quickly, and the businesses usually never recover, or at least not without a huge expense. As an internet user, you should take all precautions to protect yourself and hope that your organization and those you do business with are doing the same. Above all, have a backup of your files not connected to your computer, on a drive, or even in the cloud. Remember that all types of malware require that your computer and your devices are not being patched or updated, especially your Windows operating system. Remember that above all, you need to invest in a proper security software. 
from a reputable manufacturer. Definitely not one of those free antivirus pop-ups. Take every precaution as that cyber criminals are banking on your lack of cyber awareness and lack of precautions. The one thing you will notice is that these cyber criminals will not ask you for your credit cards or cash. They want something called Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a form of cryptocurrency, a new digital currency, which is completely untraceable. That untraceability is what these cyber criminals like. It makes for a low likelihood of being caught, and the money is long gone if the authorities do happen to catch up to them. Bitcoin is becoming one of the strongest currencies on the planet and on the internet, and is now accepted at various retailers. Think, the next time you buy a latte at Starbucks, you might be paying in Bitcoin instead of using your debit card. In all seriousness, Bitcoin is nothing more than complex mathematics in code format that is somehow valuable due to its rarity. The best way to defend against ransomware is to be cyber aware. Scrutinize more and always look twice before opening that mail that might be a phishing attempt. Make sure that you have an antivirus and let Windows update itself and don't delude yourself into believing that an Apple Mac is immune. They want your money and or your data. The device is just part of the challenge. Crypto ransomware is as bad as it gets for now. Who knows what tomorrow's cyber criminal will dream up next. But as long as you are cyber aware to some level, at least you know how to prepare yourself and the devices you access the internet on. Be prepared and always think before you click. Remember that phishing can be in person or over the phone. So be extra cautious when giving details to a stranger, which is literally what you do by having too many public posts on your social media. Check yours and check your children's. You can never be too secure or cyber aware. Thank you for taking my class. Cybersecurity Awareness Training Conclusions and Awareness now that you have come to the end of the course, and perhaps are a little more cyber aware than you were before, you now have a better idea of how to be safe online, at home, at work, or on your mobile device. You now know that you have to be a little more paranoid while working with yours or your employer's confidential data when working online. You are cyber aware. You know what to look for, when to think, and when to click. You know how to identify phishing techniques that would have tricked you before. You know to look carefully at emails, websites, and social media requests. So who's responsible for cybersecurity? That's right, you are. You are the first line of defense at home and at work. Thank you again for taking this course and please collect your certificate of completion at the end of the course.